Sim City. This classic city building franchise was once a household name spoken of with reverence, yet the story of Sim City had a catastrophic ending that blew up the franchise and permanently altered the city builder genre, giving city's skylines a chance to redefine it. But what exactly was it that made SimCity's simulation so effective? And how have newcomers like City's Skylines redefined the formula to create a new golden era for city builders? Well, it all began a long, long time ago. It's February 15th, 1985. A new Famicom game has just arrived on store shelves across Japan, Bungling Bay. A port of the Commodore 64 original, which released the prior year, Bungling Bay for the Famicom had a unique gameplay loop based on an economic simulation across a large seamless map. It was a hit and eventually reached sales of at least 800,000 units. Across the Pacific Ocean, Will Wright, who developed the original version for the Commodore 64, received the good news alongside some fat checks. They gave him the opportunity to slow down, relax, and tinker with ideas for his next game, and that is exactly what he did. Wright's development of the game was accomplished with a pair of software tools he had programmed himself, Chedit and Wedit. And these tools would by happenstance become fundamental elements of SimCity's original gameplay design. You see, today games like Cities, Skylines, and its sequel can display tens of thousands of 3D objects rendered in real time. But in the early days of PC gaming, computers were slow. So slow that even bit-mapped graphics were difficult to handle. Fortunately, the Commodore 64 offered a way around this, the ability to define a custom character set. Raid on Bungling Bay used the Commodore's multicolor character mode, which gave Wright access to 256 characters, 4x8 in size, which could be assembled using up to 4 colors from a palette of 16 predetermined colors. Once created, these characters could be arranged across the Commodore 64's display in a 40 by 25 grid. This was the equivalent of 320 by 200 pixels. And that is where Wedit came in. Now the W, as you might have guessed, stands for World, and Wright used his World Editor to take the characters he created and chatted and spread them across this grid. The characters might seem boring or nonsensical when viewed on their own, but when tiled together they could start to create recognizable objects and terrain from factories and roads to grasslands and shorelines. This is the technique Wright used for Bungling Bay, and it explains the tile-based nature of the original SimCity as well as all SimCity games that came after it, except of course, for the 2013 reboot. Put simply, Chedit was used to create the tiles and what it was used to piece those tiles together into a cohesive video game world. But that is only half the story. There's another element of SimCity that goes along with its tile-based design, but I think is poorly understood, and that is the city simulation itself. Players of cities, skylines who load up SimCity today will immediately notice something very, very different about the older city builder. Each city in SimCity has a population, but it doesn't really have individual citizens. That's because the simulation is built on mathematical formulas lurking inside each one of those tiles. I think it's fair to say a city in any version of SimCity, from SimCity to SimCity 4 at least, is really just an attractive spreadsheet. Now, this actually should not come as much of a shock. Remember, as I said earlier, computers in this era were very, very slow. Even games that seemed to use a physical simulation like Microsoft Flight Simulator actually functioned by referencing predetermined data from a table. In all versions of that game prior to Flight Simulator 2020, you are effectively flying a spreadsheet. There simply were not enough compute resources available to calculate all the variables in real time. Of course, in the case of SimCity, this approach to designing the simulation was critical to both how the game was programmed and its identity in gaming culture. And this actually happened because of Will Wright's chance encounter with a book called Urban Dynamics. The book was penned by J. Wright Forrester, who after helping to invent magnetic core memory and leading a team to create the world's first computer graphics animation, started to wonder how computers might simulate the success or failure of companies. In the late 1960s, however, Forrester diverted his efforts to explaining the growth of cities, which led to his 1969 book, Urban Dynamics. It outlined a system of equations and variables that, when processed by a computer, simulated a city's population, employment, land value, and other important statistics. 
Wright realized he could use these ideas to create his own simulation, one which functioned by calculating a series of values for each tile in a city's map. The result is a very literal interpretation of a city simulation. The citizens themselves are irrelevant. All that matters is how they collectively work together to form a city. That might sound a bit dystopian, but it had a very important advantage. The math could be made simple enough to process in real time on contemporary hardware. And in fact, the flexibility and performance of this style of simulation is a key advantage that even City's skyline has not quite overcome. If you load SimCity 3000 or SimCity 4 today, you might be struck by just how rapidly the population of your cities grow. Newer versions of SimCity can support tens and, in the case of SimCity 4, hundreds of millions of residents, because the games don't really model hundreds of millions of residents. Instead, the game models numerous values, such as land value, tile by tile, and then assigns population based on those values. It was a highly effective simulation for its time, but it did have limitations. Perhaps the most obvious is the tile-based nature of the design, which harkens all the way back to the Commodore 64. This meant curved roads and irregularly shaped lots were just not a thing in most versions of SimCity, something that was not changed until the 2013 SimCity reboot. SimCity's simulation also breaks down when played at a high level. Expert players can pick up on patterns that lead to optimal outcomes, and pursuing those patterns to maximize population results in a simulated city that, although beautiful in its own strange way, is thoroughly unrealistic. Perhaps that is why Will Wright began to distance himself from the SimCity franchise almost as soon as it came out. Many modern gamers assume that Will Wright was the lead designer on all the SimCity games, but that was only true on the original. Wright shared design credits with lead designer Fred Haslam on SimCity 2000, and Wright was not heavily involved with SimCity 3000 or SimCity 4. Wright's attention was also redirected by a personal tragedy. In 1991, the Wright family lost their home and nearly all of their possessions in a wildfire. As he and his family began to rebuild, Wright turned his thoughts to the reasons why people buy, acquire, and brag about the things that they own, from their home to their car or even a simple t-shirt. This eventually led to the design of Maxis's most successful title, The Sims, a game that's entirely focused on the wants and needs of individual simulated citizens. And of course, as you probably know, The Sims was successful. Too successful, at least if you're a fan of SimCity. Maxis had struggled for years to recapture the glory days of SimCity's initial unexpected and runaway success, and finally it had happened. After the release of The Sims, however, Maxis, now a division of Electronic Arts, took a different approach than before, and the studio consolidated all of its efforts around The Sims. There was only one exception to this, and that was Wright's new pet project, Spore, which occupied all of his time. And this turn of events had a radical effect on city-building games. With The Sims selling in the millions and Will Wright moving on to his new pet project, SimCity was left to languish. And with SimCity out of the picture, so went most of the city builder genre. However, in the background, there were some smaller city builder franchises starting to forge their own identity. Anno, Tropico, and The Settlers come to mind. But these games took a distinctly different approach to the genre. Instead of a tile-based simulation of values calculated under the hood, these games relied more on individual AI entities and resource management to decide how development proceeds. This, of course, is the approach taken by both the 2013 reboot of SimCity and by Cities Skylines, and it's ultimately what led to the current renaissance in the city builder genre. But to truly understand why this difference is so important, let's take a closer look at the details of the city simulation in SimCity 4 and Cities Skylines. One reason why citizens need to commute in both games is their employment. In SimCity 4, this begins with a destination finder. It runs a simple calculation that discovers whether any jobs are plausibly within reach. Note that the exact calculation is actually unknown as the source code of SimCity 4 has never been released, but community research suggests it considers factors like roads and mass transit near the citizen's point of origin. Assuming a job is available and the destination finder is otherwise satisfied, SimCity 4 attempts to find a path between the citizen's home and the job. Once a path is found, the citizen can proceed to the job. But hold on a second, SimCity 4 doesn't use individual AI agents, and I said earlier that individual citizens aren't modeled in the simulation. So what is this about pathfinding? 
Here is how it works. The Pathfinder runs, and if it finds a path, the citizen departs. But they don't actually depart. They don't appear in the game or interact with the environment. Instead, SimCity 4 uses the path to model the traffic that should appear between the citizen's home and their job. When many paths intersect, SimCity 4 knows that more cars should appear on that section of the road. But the cars on the road don't directly represent any of the particular citizens. Traffic is just a facade, fading in and out of existence depending on how busy a stretch of road is calculated to be. This is a very functional simulation, but it does have some deep problems. For example, SimCity can't really simulate bus, subway, or commuter train routes. The Pathfinder does use transit, but there is no actual bus to wait for. The Pathfinder instead treats bus stops like dots on a grid, each with a particular usable radius. Citizens that use these bus stops sort of magically teleport between them. It's an unfortunate and unavoidable side effect of the tile-based simulation right laid down for SimCity when working with Chedit and Wedit on the Commodore 64. Now the way that Cities Skylines handles it is of course quite a bit different. Cities also runs a pathfinding step to find a citizen a job, but once complete, the citizen leaves their residence and is depicted by an AI agent in the traffic simulation. The citizen might leave in a car, in which case they follow the road system, they stop at intersections and for traffic, which can lead to traffic jams. Or if they use public transit, they might leave their residence on foot and step on a bus, which moves along paths determined by the player. As a result, Cities Skylines is able to simulate citizen movement in ways SimCity could only ever approximate. Now you might be thinking, great, but that's traffic. What about the rest of the simulation? Well, this is where Cities Skylines does something very clever. In SimCity, the basic unit of the simulation is the tile, but in City Skylines, the basic unit of the simulation is the individual AI agents in the traffic simulator. Police need to get to the site of crimes. Firefighters need to respond to fires. Citizens need to find jobs, of course, but they also must visit other buildings like schools and healthcare. There is even an economic system in the background with industrial buildings producing goods, shipping them to commercial buildings, and then having those goods sold to citizens. If the traffic in a city gets too out of hand, some of these trips will begin to fail, and that will cause headaches as goods don't reach their destination or citizens fail to show up for work. It is a very effective alternative to SimCity Simulator and provides better feedback for the player. In SimCity, you have to look at data views in order to get a good idea what's going on in your city because so much of the simulation is bound up in the tiles and actually rather opaque. However, in cities, skylines, you can get a pretty good idea of what is going on by just looking at the traffic in your city and seeing if there are any major blockages. If there are not, you're probably in good shape. And if you see a major traffic jam in the center of your city, you are probably headed for some pain. But of course, it's not perfect. Cities Skylines has been criticized as a traffic simulator rather than a city simulator, and there is a little bit of merit to that line of thinking. Once traffic stacks up, everything can grind to a halt, regardless of how well the rest of your city is doing. The traffic system also has consequences for scale of cities. Roads, vehicles, and transit seems to take up a lot of physical space within cities, and designing a densely packed urban core can become rather fussy. That is one situation where SimCity's abstraction of transit can prove to be a benefit. So that is an overview of the particulars of how cities' skylines evolved on the ideas of SimCity and the core differences that make them very different city simulation games. For me, the big takeaway is this. The character of a game can often come about just through happenstance and experimentation. The tile-based spreadsheet-like simulation of SimCity was derived by the constraints that Wright had to work with on his prior title, Bungling Bay, which had nothing to do with city simulation at all and the designers who came after him had to build on those restraints for SimCity 3000 and SimCity 4. Despite that, they were able to create some fantastic city building games. And actually, the story of City Skylines is very similar. As hardcore players of that game probably already know, City Skylines was preceded by the Cities in Motions games, which were transportation managers. The simulation of traffic and transit came first, and then the developer, Colossal Order, found a way to make that the core of a full-fledged city simulator. As a result, the transportation systems are extremely well thought out, but City Skylines doesn't do a lot to evolve on some other elements like the power grid and water distribution. 
These elements are still relatively basic and not all that different from how they functioned in the SimCity games. Now, Cities Skylines developer Colossal Order has already announced that some of these elements will be enhanced in Cities Skylines 2, but I am sure it will still face technical restraints that force some compromises. We are still a long way from computers that can accurately simulate even a modestly sized city, and until we have them, developers will have to continue making smart choices to build city simulators that keep gamers coming back for more.